I hope that your business will be a part of the great Africa story that we seek to build and write about, a business day and indeed in other progressive media on the African continent. We especially invite businesses in all industries, all sizes, and in every country and region in Africa to aggregate and to create this story of Africa Connected. As I begin to end my remarks, I'd like to give a special welcome and to offer our gratitude to our partners for the 2023 convention. Our immense gratitude go to Professor Benedict Orama, President and Chairman of the Africa Export Import Bank, AFREX, represented here this morning by our good friend, Tito. You're welcome, sir. Tito is a director of communication and events at Africa and Bank. My appreciation also goes to Mohammed Dawish, the Nigerian CEO of IHS TARS, for the remarkable support that they have provided over the years. May I also express our appreciation to Von Kamedi for those who have come out of Lagos. It is sometimes this day is quite harrowing to move around. Whether you have petrol or whether you don't. When you have petrol, you run into queues of those who have no petrol. And they see absolutely no reason why you're in a hurry. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank all our speakers again and to say that we're indeed very eager and anxious uh, to listen to them share their insights and especially for those who have come here to join us physically like my sister Ibokun, thank you so very much for being always there for us and thank you all ladies and gentlemen for coming out this morning I do hope you would have a great day with us here today once again thank you to the theme of the Africa Business Conference and that's why we are here. We are very proud to support uh, this platform, not just at a tactical level, but we'll always be here uh, to support. The title of this section is about the company, so I'll very briefly uh, give a profile of Afreximbank. We are celebrating 30 years this year. It was established in 1993. And it's an entity that was born out of adversity. It was founded during the financial crisis of the late 80s. And that's the sole reason that uh, Afrex Impact exists. It is to support our member countries during uh, good times and bad times as well. So we do large-scale financing because we cannot progress without capital. It's all very well for us to speak of a new Africa, but without sustained and uh, increasing amounts of capital, development is not really possible. So AfriXMark is there as a partner to all the partner states of Africa, all the member states, uh, all uh, corporates who are scaling up to operate at a continental level. Just before COVID, and I was quite curious about this, a German non-NGO invited some African leaders, I don't mean political leaders now, to um, a conference in Italy outside of Milan. And it turned out that the focus was simply on the understanding that if the sub-regional leaders don't make progress, that is, African sub-regional leaders, leaders in this case meaning the countries that appear to be, you know, more endowed in, this, in Africa, if they don't make progress, there was just no way Africa was going to make progress. Simply. If Nigeria doesn't make progress or if Nigeria fails, the whole of West Africa fails. 
Good morning, everyone. So I'll, I'll start first, I'll try and take it from the women's side. If 50% of your population is made up of women, and you do not have a strategy around maximizing the capacity and the talents of those women, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you're never going to deliver. Because you're already undermined from the onset. And we have a lot of factors to deactivate in order to put ourselves in even a competitive position. We need to break all the cultural mindset that puts a lock and a cap on the female gender within our population. Because if we really do want to be a productive continent and maximize all the assets we have, every daughter that is yours, because you know, when you talk about women, they always sound like some strange women to everybody. But we're talking about your daughters, we're talking about your sisters, we're talking about your wife, we're talking about your mother, we're talking about the women you love and the ones that haven't come yet, the generations of your granddaughters, when they would come. And whatever foundation we lay now, policy-wise and everything, is exactly what's going to rule their lives and their opportunity. When, when violence came to look for me, I didn't even understand what they were saying. But then they invited me to attend a conference in Switzerland. And we were going to have some meetings on the sideline of that conference. First shock was as I walked into this massive hall filled with everybody. I didn't see boys. I saw men. And I saw women. I saw a lot of mature adult people from every financial institution in the world you can imagine, global players, and I'm like, okay, what's going on here? In my country, they're saying this thing is like black oil, that it's something behind the table. But every global player was in the room to discuss blockchain and all the crypto and web three. Two, when I got to my hotel, there was a vending machine in the reception of my hotel to buy crypto, I knew they would struggle. Because you see, once anything gets to commoditization, then you know that the value chain has gone far. So what does a woman do when she finds herself surrounded by a bevy of um, futures? You decide to look within first of all. It's not just about them, it's about what you want. And that's what Africa needs to do. We need to stop the way that we have engaged when we've had this sort of attention from the uh, global north previously. We need to look in us and decide what do we want? Where are our needs? What are our strengths? What are we willing to give? And also, how do we strengthen our hand at the negotiation table by having greater regional integration? The more integrated we are, the more we speak with one voice, the more powerful we are at the table. I think those are some of the things that Africa needs to do. We also need to start to work and focus on our areas of uh, comparative advantage. I think somebody made a, uh, made a comment about that earlier. What are, for the different countries, build, for instance, centers of excellence, maybe around different uh, value chains or different activities in the manufacturing sector so that we're able to work together and operate from a powerful position in engaging with all of these sectors who seem to be seeking their hands in marriage.
travel trend around election season, um, you see that there is always an exponential increase in outbound travel leading up to, up to the elections, particularly when there is um, an expected change in government. Um, four years ago, it wasn't um, as critical, even though every time um, there is an election, you always have a crop of people that do not want to be um, around during election season. But eight years ago, when there was a change in government, um, then I was with Lufthansa Group. Our flights were packed. I'm sure we saw, if you remember eight years ago, we saw um, the airports everywhere was packed leading up to the election days. Now for this, I think people are beginning to preempt it a bit more. Um, we do not expect um, any violence, we expect a peaceful transition. However, what we've seen, the trend that we've seen is that since, since December, we've seen an earlier booking behavior. Um, typically, Nigeria is a late booking market, so people, bookings typically drop uh, like two, three, maximum a week to travel, Nigerians are late bookers, yeah? What we say is that since December, um, it has been a change in that trend because we've seen a lot of bookings for travel in February being booked in December. And you can only attribute that to not being around um, for the election season. And that trend has continued um, into January. So the, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, we've seen an increase in outbound travel. Now, has it typically been, uh, it also results in an increase in uh, travel within um, Africa? I would say it's a bit modeled up now because of the intense um, Jaffa season that we are in. Um, I think a lot of planning has been done as well to ensure that the people that are trying to Jaffa is done also ahead of elections. So that number would be skewed a bit. But what we've seen even um, from last year is that intra-African travel, there has been a, a huge growth in intra-African travel. And I think it's also linked to um, increasing capacity um, within Africa. The uh, African airlines are beginning to add more routes from, um, from Lagos, from Abuja, um, from Kano, from Enugu. So by virtue of that, of course, a lot of trade, a lot of business transactions, even around the election, we saw a lot of movement within Africa. It cannot be attributed directly to migration. Um, however, there's been an increase, an exponential increase um, in outbound travel um, since December, in the past six weeks. That is not typical of the Nigerian. So Chan Group is an organization that represents African countries and um, members of the United States Congress. Um, I started my career in politics and then sports and then somehow made it into the tech waters. So cybersecurity for me is very personal because I've been scammed. So I want to do a little survey. Show of hands. Anyone in this room has ever been scammed on? Come on. Just three people. That's all I <laughs> So, my first scam, I have to tell you, my first scam, I was 16 years old. 15, 16. I was fresh off of my secondary school. I grew up in Napa, in Kachina. And I had a computer. <laughs> and I got on AOL online. And someone, the little thing flashed on the side and it said, win $5,000. So let me enter my security details, my social. I'm 15, what can that hurt? Do you know within maybe two or three days, my mom calls me and says, people are calling her phone, that someone took bank account, someone put my social security. And so I'm sitting at home thinking, what's happening? That was a lie, or what's going on? <laughs> thinking that I clicked one of those pop-ups, right? So that was, I was 16, I'm now 37 years old. The nature of cyber but even more so in the last three years. In the last three years of the pandemic, it's been a scammer's paradise from the United States to here in Nigeria. And I'll give you a stat. Uh, the US State Department released um, some numbers about two months ago. Three billion dollars of PPP, personal check protection, had been siphoned from the United States and into Africa. $3 billion in cash.
first of all, I want to thank Business Day for inviting me to be part of this very important discussion. I also want to agree with previous speakers that policy is a key driver in all we're talking about. And if we don't have the right policies that are implementable and can be enforced effectively, um, it won't work. And secondly, I want to also say that um, those of us in the room that have heard about this today, we should all become advocates. We need a lot of awareness, drive, and advocacy. So we need to create our education from what we've learned today and even what we already know. And finally, I want to also say that we all have a role to play. Today we're talking about the government role, we're talking about um, industrial industries, their role, but we as consumers, these products we're talking about, we all use them, we all desire them, and we all need them. Or how do we manage the waste that comes out of it? So we all have a role to play and we have a collective responsibility to ensure that the waste we generate does not become a problem for us today and also for our future. So please, let's all work together to ensure that we can have a cleaner environment and a cleaner world to live. Thank you. Thanks. So, so what I think really is, um, I think the ecosystem is a bit more broader described it and um, there are different phases to it um, for those who are in um, venture capital um, those are obviously the people who are bringing in the money right because they've seen a good idea and hopefully they can make some gains out of it and there are also you know different strata if I should use that word so it depends on if you want to focus on each uh, but I, I don't think you know, it may be correct to band them all as not being effective. What I think is that we're still, um, the ecosystem is still, is still young, you know, and like Luchi also mentioned, there's lots of work that needs to go into it. But I like to take the, you know, the crawl, walk, run approach. Uh, we may not be able to consider, compare ourselves to uh, places like you know, Europe where they have much more developed and robust uh, ecosystem. For example, things like policy is very important. Uh, if you are aware, uh, the Nigerian Stalin Bill you know, just went through uh, a couple of months ago. And that's you know, a huge success that I think we should celebrate first of all, right? Like I mentioned to you, 67% of you know, 5.4 billion that came in to the continent came to Nigeria, right? That's also a huge success we should, uh, we should celebrate as well. And the other areas that are um, lacking, if I should use that word, we now need to find you know, professionals or partners who will come together to say, you know, we've seen uh, this initiative work in this part. Let's begin to build, you know, communities or groups or ecosystems to make sure that in addition to what the structures that we see working currently, you know, we find ways to make it, you know, much more uh, robust and resilient. Uh, Thank you very much. For fintechs, unlike the commercial banks, commercial banks are free to do whatever they want to do. You know, it it's stems, you know, to think that a commercial bank will not be great because they have the license to practically do what they can do in the you know financial sector. But for fintechs, for every innovation that you have to come up with, you need a license to do that. You need to find out what license or what regulation CDN has you know, put up for the fintech to be able to carry out that particular innovation and transaction. So that's a very, very huge problem. And when you look at it with what um, Africa has done um, and in collaboration with the African continental free trade area, where you have got up the you know, Pan-African payment system sense. Um, I think that is a fantastic solution, right? If we both the banking sector and the non-banking sector can be included, right? So you see places like Ghana. Ghana is saying that once it kicks off, you know, properly, because I know that it was a launch in 2022 January. Once it kicks off properly, both the banking sector and the OFIs will have access to the Pan-African payment system, and I think that would really help. If the fintechs are also allowed to you know, drive innovation and drive last mile, you know, um, inclusion, right, from the part of CDN. So CDN wants the financial inclusion.
know, but they're not giving us the access to be able to do as much as we want to do. The traditional brands will focus on maybe the big corporates, but for fintechs, right, we want to reach the last mile. We want to enable businesses, small businesses, individuals, people that are not necessarily, you know, digital savvy, so to say, to be able to carry out transactions and then include them into the banking um, sector, financial sector. So for us to be able to do that, regulation is key to enable us all the resources together to help ourselves. And that's why I'm here to meet other people, create a, um, a fund, and then fund in different, pro in different countries. Right? And that is, that's my aim. Big uh, banks managers, fund managers, because you can create um, uh, regulated fund regulated entities, be it in, in uh, Europe or in Africa, uh, in Mauritius or anywhere, then you create these regulated entities. With these regulated entities, everybody invests, be it in Africa or everywhere, they are regulated, then they invest in this project around uh, in Africa. It, it's, for me, I, it's the first time that I'm in, in uh, Nigeria, Right? You have oil, but you're cleaning up to put fuel. Why? Because you process it somewhere else. You know? <laughs> everything, everything, everything is like that in Africa. We have, we have to take uh, care of ourselves. That's, that's, that's my message. I run the fine education. I know PhDs in pop culture. I actually know somebody who's doing a PhD in rap. Like rap, His, her PhD is in rap. Like, it's how we think about these things and how we conceptualize. You know, when the things, when you go to New York, for example, some of the best employed people are people who do pedicures. And New York is known for the, the, the place where you get the best pedicures and manicures. And it's usually Koreans and Chinese yeah. people. Nigeria does much better pedicures than, than anywhere that I've been in the yeah. world. Much better. The level is like this. When you go to those pedicure salons, right, those boys, they're like usually boys. There's girls sometimes, but there's young men. They have blonde hair, they have earrings. There's something playing on the TV. It's some, you know, akatam, like some, and what's it? Uh, organize everybody, organize whatever it is. You can see the joy and they're vibing, but they're earning a living and they're paying for their family. True. It's fulfilling, dignified work. So the way we conceptualize education, we can't all go to university. We should not aspire to go to university. Your plumber, if you live in the UK, plumbing is more expensive. In fact, I remember when, if my toilet broke down, I will literally be having shivers that the plumber is more expensive than calling a doctor. We don't have plumbers in Nigeria. We don't have carpenters that can do a straight line. We can't all go to university. We should not all aspire to go to university. But also the narrative about what education is, we all want our kids to be doctors, nurses, sorry, doctors, lawyers, all of that. That I would not want my kid to be a lawyer, God forbid. Because it's five years in yes. school. It's five years, I, I, yes. I have a doctorate in law. Five years in school, you can't go to law, you have to re-qualify, go to America, re-qualify, re-qualify, re-qualify. After that, you spend 20 years doing school. You know, plumber is earning more than you. So the way we think about this is really important. Thank you so much. We have to look at it. I mean, the Africa Free Trade Agreement is, is fantastic. It's, it's a step in the right direction. But clearly, we need to act in our own interest. And whichever countries have a comparative advantage in um, producing, you know, manufacturing, we need to, um, you know, get the make sure that that trade is happening within African countries. It should not be cheaper to import things from China. A lot of the things we import from China, you can source them from African countries. The only problem is that the logistics, the transportation to get those products to um, different African countries just does not exist because of the, the, the legacy of colonial rule. 
Now, there are efforts to improve that. The, there's ASCAT Air, Air which, I uh, mean, it's, you know, it's easier to get around North Africa, but the costs of travel are still very, very high, and the costs of transportation are still very, very high. The African governments need to look into this because if we are able to trade with each other, we insulate ourselves from these shocks, from you know sanctions on Russia, uh, and you know you're sanctioning Russia, but you're indirectly sanctioning Africa and driving people into poverty. Yes, let me.